Let's sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. in Christ alone. I wish I could be here to hear everyone sing this one. This is one that everyone always sings from the heart, and um, it's just so great to hear the congregation sing along. I wish I could be there with you guys. Um, but I will imagine in my heart and in my ears that you guys are there singing with me, but let's sing um, in Christ alone. i 
to the, the God who came to save us and the God who's coming back. Um, so why don't you stand with me and we will worship our Lord together. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome to Palm Sunday. That's right, we're in the Easter week coming up now. And we're glad that you're with us here online. Wish you could be with us in person, and we hope that maybe you could join us on Easter Sunday right here at Quail Lake Church. We've got a big circus tent we're putting up, and by golly, it's going to be uh, kind of a cool deal we're doing on that Sunday. So uh, think about joining us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, today, though, we've got something else we're going to be looking at. We're calling it the Big Parade because this is what is called the triumphal entry. We're going to look at that and look at it a little bit differently today and see some of the things that God was doing, maybe even behind the scenes. So let's pray, and then we'll get started on the message today. Father, we thank you. You're a great God, a God who loves us, a God who keeps his promises, a God who reminds us again and again of your great love for us. And We thank you for that. And we ask God today that you would speak to our hearts. It's Easter. And Lord, we thank you for this great season, for all that it means, for the miracle that you've done. And Lord, for, for just, the, just the whole impact that it makes on the future of all of us human beings. So thank you for that. Be with us today. I pray for every person who's watching. Lord, they've, some of them are dealing with real troubles and some are just kind of feeling down today. Some of them are struggling with finances or relationships, whatever it is. God, I pray that as you draw close to them, that there would be this sense of your healing presence, that you give them confidence in you. And Father, encourage their hearts. Thank you for that. Now we ask that you speak to us. And Lord, we pray that you would encourage our hearts right now. And ask it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to read this scripture. We've been kind of breaking things up as we've been going through our Corinthians um, study here. And, and uh, we just go phrase by phrase. We're going to do that. But I want, to, I want us to hear the whole thing here. And we're going to do this, what they call the triumphal entry. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. All in one kind of, kind of shot here. So you see what it is. We're going to work from Matthew Chapter 21, all the Gospels have this, but we're going to take Matthew's perspective on what took place. It starts like this. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, <clears throat> Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise God in highest heaven! Well, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds replied, it is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. My dad was different from just about every dad I've ever known. None of my friends' dads had the same thing going that my dad had going. A lot of them were veterans, a lot of them were teachers, coaches, all those kinds of things that my dad was. But I never found anybody else who said, my dad used to be a circus performer. Yep, my dad was in the circus. Kind of explains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> my grandparents were a part of a circus, too. They were in a community circus in Gainesville, Texas. I want to give you a little background on this. In 1929, the Depression is just getting started and everything else, and they did this. They were going to do this kind of a, a theater presentation in this little town in Texas. And so they had everything set to go. They'd spent money on it, and they were going to sell tickets and all this kind of stuff as people came. And it was the worst sleet and snowstorm in their history. No one came. They lost all the money for it. They were in debt now for $300. Now, remember, this is 1929. And so they had this debt. Nothing happened and all of it. And they decided that 
you know, we've got to do something to, to, to make back this money. And so as 1930 came, they decided, why don't we do a circus? And so they did. They did a circus for three days. They made over $425, which again was good money in those days. Paid off the debt and had money left over. And they said, you know, we ought to keep doing this. And they did. And it grew and grew and grew to the point that this circus was the third largest circus in the United States of America. As a matter of fact, President Roosevelt's son, Elliot, his second son, actually was their ringmaster for a short time. So it was a big deal. My grandfather was a clown. My grandmother, she was, had an aerial act. And my dad, he was a, one of the acrobats. But one of the things they would talk about is the parade. When they'd come into a town, a lot of the towns were in Texas or Oklahoma, or that kind of area in the southwest. They'd come in, and they had seven wagons, a calliope, all this stuff. They had animals. They bought an elephant. And they would come into town just like you see in the movies. And the people would be cheering and everything else. And it was this glorious parade. And he said it was really something special to be a part of. Well, we're going to see that today, a special parade, but one that was done 2,000 years ago. And we're going to start off by labeling this section the final approach. It's almost like Jesus is coming in for a landing. And we're just going to take part of one verse, verse 1. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, <clears throat> that's where we're going to stop. That's it. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem. Because we need to kind of figure out, how did we get here? Have you ever witnessed something that seems so out of the ordinary at the time, and yet it turned out to be something so special? It was really so big that you, you had a hard time wrapping your head around how important it really was. And what we're seeing here could be that. This parade of coming into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday. It could have been a one and done kind of a thing. They'd done this before. I'm sure they'd celebrated people coming into town and all of that. But Jesus comes into town. Folks rejoice and it could have been, that's it. But if you look close to what's been left for us in this history, we can see the drama that's there. The drama that's unfolding before us because so clearly, just like Christmas, with all the prophecies and everything else, what God is doing is demonstrating he's a promise keeper. He keeps his promises. And everything that's done, including this, is done purposely. This is a march into the jaws of the enemy. Now, Jesus is going not into the jaws of the Jewish leaders or the Roman army or anything. It's Satan himself. That's who he's going up against. And you know, when he comes into town, even though we see all the pantry, uh, pageantry and everything else, I, I get this feeling, it's almost like one of those old westerns where the hero comes into town and you know there's going to be a showdown coming up. And that's what's taking place. It's a showdown, though, that no human could have ever envisioned. And at that time, would have never understood it anyway. But this is a march to liberate the human race from the slavery that we've been under and the slavery that so many are still under today. But here's the turning point. The turning point for us humans right here on planet Earth. So how did we get here on what will be forever called Palm Sunday? Well, let's step back one day from where we are here. This is Sunday, remember? So we're on Saturday. That's the Jewish Sabbath. The day of worship, Jesus, Jesus is respectful to Jewish law, and that was you don't travel on the Sabbath. <clears throat> but today, he has traveled from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now, what has happened in Jericho, according to what Matthew writes, is that Jesus did one more thing, one more healing. If you go back to chapter 20, we're in 21. Go back to 20. We didn't even read anything about that. Go back to 20 and look the last thing that takes place is that he's in Jericho, he's passing through Jericho, and there are two blind men there. And they know that Jesus is coming through town. They heard that he was going to be passing through. Now, there was already a crowd that was following Jesus, it says, as he's coming into Jericho. He's making his way to Jerusalem. Lots of folks are go just going on their own for the Passover. But these men know that it is Jesus. And knowing what he'd done for others, they begin to cry out. They're loud, even aggressive. 
and the crowd is kind of embarrassed. They're telling me, you guys be quiet. You're embarrassing us. You know, we want to leave a good impression on Jesus. But they know that he's a guy who can heal them. And Jesus looks at them and asks, what do you want? And they say, we want to see. And he just touches them. And they can see. They were blind, and now they can see. And what they do, and this is the end of that chapter, just before we get to this, is it says, they joined the crowd that was with Jesus as he came to Jerusalem. And then we go on, because what we see is keeping of a promise. We'll continue, verse 1. They came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go to that village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. Now, in those days, it would have been about 13 miles that they would have traveled from Jericho to Bethphage. You go, what do you mean in those days? Well, you see, there are highways now and free and, you know, roads and everything. And they didn't have those in those days. There were paths that were well-worn and they well-traveled. But, you know, those are gone. So we're estimating it was probably probably about 13 miles, and then another two miles from Bethphage all the way down to Jerusalem. So God is working here. He's working in this whole thing with this donkey. Now, when Jesus is saying that, hey, just tell him the Lord needs it and all that, well, you know, okay, it all belongs to God anyway, right? We're using what's his. That's kind of kind of fits. But why would the guy really have let them use this donkey now the owner may or may not have known who jesus was or that this was even going for jesus because jesus's name is not used in the conversation as we look at other other uh, accounts of this why did he give it up well there are a couple of things going on here obviously god is working this guy's heart but there was a great sense of kind of comradeship between the people in and around jerusalem and those people who were pilgrims who were coming to celebrate the big Passover uh, feast. And the Jewish people took seriously the command to help travelers and those who were coming to worship. And what people would do is that they would build their houses and then they would build an outside staircase. And they might put a little shelter over the top of their roof and they would leave that for people who could come and they could spend the night. And they would spend the night in that, that upper room, if you will. And so people were ready to help out. Now, the Passover's coming. He knows that. But why he would give it to these guys whom he's never seen before? Well, God's working here. Now, notice what the disciples say. When they're asked, they're simply to say, the Lord has need of it. Not Jesus, not the God of Israel, not just the Lord has need of it. And what is being played out here is a promise that God had made 500 years before. And it's from Zechariah 9, 9. The prophet Zechariah said this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. God had not forgotten. But why so long? Well, God has his own timing. And that's something for you and me to keep in mind in our own lives, too. When we're looking for God to do stuff, this is a 500 years. Hopefully it won't be 500 years for you, but, but you know, that works that way. Sometimes when we feel God has promised something to you specifically, we need to remember that his timing is perfect. Like they say, God is never late, but God is never early either because when he acts, that's the right time. So Jesus has given direction to his two disciples. And for some reason, another thing that's kind of crazy about this is all the gospel accounts have the same thing. They don't name who these guys are. We don't know who these two disciples are. But what we do know is that they carried out orders that they were given to the letter. 
They're told where to go. Okay. Then they're told what they will see. Then they're told what to do. And then they're told what to say. Now, there isn't a lot of wiggle room here. God is pretty specific in what they're told. And we need to remember that, too, for our own lives. That God has left us, you and me, a lot of specific stuff that we're to do as his followers. These guys were obedient. Ever wonder why Jesus picked these two mystery men to do this? Uh, you know, I think about crazy stuff like this. I sit up at night and think, why, why would you pick these two guys out of all the people? Why these two? Found a verse. John 14, 21 <clears throat> says, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. I bet he saw in two of those guys a love that was strong enough that they would do exactly like he said. I like that. These two guys were committed in their love for Jesus. And they get the call and they do what they're commanded to do. In the other gospel accounts, they record that indeed they were confronted by the owner of the donkey. And why are you untying my donkey and colt? And they did as Jesus told them. And the owner simply says, okay, go for it. And both donkeys are brought to Jesus for this special purpose. The purpose of keeping the promise of God that the king of kings will come, come to his people, riding on a donkey and on a donkey's colt. Well, then there's the royal treatment. The royal treatment comes. Start at verse 7 here. They brought the donkey and the colt to him, and they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, you need to remember, this is Passover. For us to understand what Passover is like, you've got to do something with me. You have to imagine a day that it's Christmas, Super Bowl Sunday and the 4th of July all on the same day or maybe at least all on the same week. It's just crazy. It was a huge festival that remembered what God had done in freeing the Israelites from their slavery in Egypt. Now, the Israelites had nothing when they were slaves. No power, no wealth, nothing. And what God did was he shut down one of the most powerful military machines of that time, and freed his people. Freed his people. And then they were commanded to remember God's rescuing that he did for his people. Now, the place to do this was in Jerusalem. You could do it at your own home. You know, people were in other countries and such. But you know what? If you were going to be a faithful Jew, you did what you could to make it to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, there was kind of a, a deal where you had to go so many times in your lifetime to really be obedient to God, they felt like. Now, you know, later on, for years after the Romans pushed the Jewish people out of this country, and it's going to come in about 30 years, they're going to push all the Jews out of Israel because they were just too much trouble. Too much trouble for the Romans. They said, no, just go. And they push them into Europe, into Asia. They push them into Africa, all these different places. And in those years... Those centuries, Jews would gather in those foreign countries. And when they ended their Passover celebration, you know what they would say to each other? Next year in Jerusalem. That was the promise. Next year we'll go to Jerusalem. And that all became reality when Israel became a sovereign nation again in 1948. That had never happened before on our planet. And so this day... We find them a country that's been occupied by Roman conquerors for three generations now. And here's that crowd. that has been following Jesus. And the main reason is what? Well, he's a good guy and real likable, teaches good stuff. But he does miracles. He does miracles. He can smack down the laws of physics, biology, and change life in an instant. He can heal people. He can free them from demonic possession that Satan has put people in. He can make food for thousands. And this is the biggie because this had happened just recently. People say that they have seen him bring people back from the dead. They know he's somebody special. God is with him in some special kind of way. Now, he seems to be a pretty great guy and loving person and they love the way that he sticks it to the pompous religious leaders of 
of that day because these religious leaders were making their lives miserable. And so here they are. They're gathered around Jesus. Hundreds, maybe thousands are there. The donkeys are there. It's sort of like being at the start line. They're a couple of miles outside the gates of Jerusalem, and the people want to show how excited they are. And they begin to cut branches off and wave them, some palm branches. That's where we get the Palm Sunday part. But most of them, they take off their outer clothes. It says most of this crowd, of all these people, they place them first on the donkey to make a saddle. And then maybe on both donkeys. And then they make this colorful roadway all the way up to the gates of the great city of Jerusalem on this Passover week. And it looks like this is indeed a triumphal entry. But it's not really. Because here, what Jesus is doing is declaring himself to be Messiah. And they've been given clues in the scriptures. They've read them and reread them for centuries. But no one, no one, not even the ones who are closest to Jesus can imagine what's going to happen here. But to them on this day, it has the smell of victory. And so the party begins and the parade moves to town. And so our next section we're labeled yay god maybe <laughs> verse 9 jesus was in the center of the procession and all the people around him were shouting praise god for the son of david blessings on the one who comes in the name of the lord praise god in the highest heaven now you know what's really good at this point is if you can't right where you're sitting just close your eyes for a minute and imagine the pageantry the noise the seeing, the colors of what's going on in that moment. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people, they're dancing, singing, laughing as the parade moves to the gates of the city. And then they begin kind of a singing chant. And let me read it to you in the literal translation. Now you say, well, I, I thought we were doing literal stuff. Well, actually, we have a translation that makes it easier for English speakers to read. But and this one's harder to read, but it, it kind of cuts through to what it, what it says here, and we get, a, get this special wording that's important. Matthew 21, 9, in the literal translation version, and the crowd, the ones going before and the ones following, were crying out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he coming in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is praising God. It's actually a Hebrew word, that we pronounce it as Hosanna. And what it means is, save us, we pray. It's both a praise, but also a prayer, a plea. It's an honor and at the same time an appeal. People want to be free. But the freedom they want is from the Romans. Free to live their lives as Jewish people. Nobody is thinking sacrifice for their sins. We're talking victory here. This is the best chance we have of burying those Romans forever. we got a guy who can make wine out of water. He can feed thousands with a McDonald's Happy Meal. He can touch a wounded warrior and put him or her back into battle in an instant. And should they be killed, he just might do that thing again about bringing people back from the dead. These folks aren't bad people thinking these thoughts. They're certainly not dumb people. They're desperate people. Desperate people who now have hope. Hope. But the problem with it is that it's hope in something that is so much less than what is actually being given to them and to us. Jesus is going to come to town and there's not going to be an uprising. No casting out of Roman rulers and instead he'll talk of a kingdom that they don't see that they don't understand because it is so much bigger than they could ever even imagine. And so in days, the celebration dies down. Part of it probably is that it just doesn't seem like Jesus is going to live up to his advertised buildup. And the people, like all people, after a while, they look for the next shiny object to focus their attention on. And that's something we need to be careful of today too, isn't it? Because what's happening is that we actually live with this same issue every day. This same challenge that they had. 
Sometimes we look at Jesus as sort of a good luck charm. You know, if we pat him on the head the right way, all our dreams will come true. And then we end up being disappointed in him because he didn't do like we told him. You see, I accepted him as Lord and Savior, and then I had my list of all the stuff that I wanted, and I didn't get it. You have to remember, this, this is God who became flesh. And if that's not the most audacious statement you've ever heard, I don't know what would be. It's God who became flesh and not only dwelt among us, he came to town riding on a donkey. Even Yankee Doodle got a pony. The big celebration was there, just it's going to wear off. And it's going to end in death and execution on a cross in a dumpy place outside of town. They didn't know. They didn't understand. They didn't have the imagination to dream what God might do. But that's later. On this day, on this day, there's a great celebration. And there's something about this Jesus that is worth shouting about. But he comes into town, and the question that everybody is asking is, who was that guy anyway? Verse 10, it says, The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, the party has started. The crowds are getting into it, and the city, for at least a moment, is taken aback by what's been happening. Now, I love the Greek word here. Um, when it, we, have the, we translated this as uproar, what takes place in the city. The actual Greek word is seo, seo. And it's where we get our word seismic from. And it means the shaking of the earth. And that's what they're describing in the Greek, is that they shook the whole place, his coming. That was the impact Jesus was making on the town. Not physically, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And the question they're asking is, who is this guy? Now, you see, Jesus hasn't spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. Most of the leaders there may not have known who he was. But he's making the city and the people start quaking. And on this day, the king has come in peace. The king is celebrated by the people. And you could say the king is crowned with the praises of the people who crowded around Jesus that day. But in reality, <laughs> they haven't seen anything yet. Not yet. Well, that's where we end. That's where we end. And Easter week begins. And we go all the way through the crucifixion and then the resurrection. But that's next Sunday. But what do we take away from this? What are some things we can put in our pocket here before we go? First, remember the blind men of Jericho. That wasn't even in our scripture. But I like these guys. I like these guys. Two blind guys. They were bold and loud. Not to just create a scene. Not to be obnoxious. But they knew this was their one chance to be healed. Remember the two guys in Jericho we talked about? They knew they needed what Jesus had. And wanted what Jesus could do. And they would not be denied. Now to that crowd in Jericho, they were an embarrassment. They wanted to make a good impression on Jesus the celebrity. We're good folks here. You know, we've got good manners, all this kind of stuff. But these men came desperately. Desperately as those who knew that this was their one chance in life to be able to see again. And that's the way it's always been and always will be. There are those who hunger for Jesus and don't care what society or anyone else thinks. They want him and will not be denied. I like these two guys from Jericho. They weren't even in our scripture, and yet these are the last healings before Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And I love how chapter 20, again, that's the chapter before this ends, it says, And being moved with pity, Jesus touched their eyes. And instantly their eyes received sight, and they followed him. The scene is kept for us, I think, not only because it shows the mercy of God, but it demonstrates in a dramatic way the reality of all that Jesus is doing and will do. 
These two men, they're living in a world of darkness that you can only imagine unless you're blind. They know darkness well. But they have enough faith to cry out of that darkness to Jesus. And it's a faith that is strong enough to stand up against people who tell them, you need to be in quiet. You need to be like the rest of us. You don't rock the boat. That darkness is really okay for you. <laughs> but these two won't settle for that. They cry out, and God, who's become flesh, pours out his love and power on them. And they're healed. They're no longer held captive by the darkness. And their response was to join the crowd, to journey with Jesus now. So don't be afraid to go against the crowd. Don't let them hush you up. Be bold. Be healed. Be a part of the company of Jesus. It's great advice for us today. These guys went from blind beggars rooted to one spot in Jericho where they depended on the gifts of others to people who lived history. That crowd that celebrated this Jesus coming on that glorious day. They were there. They were a part of it. Well, the next thing is, this is not the triumphal entry. Yeah, I know what your Bible says. If you look at that little thing, and it's got a little, little title up there, it says, The Triumphal Entry. You know, we all have it in our Bibles, if you have those headings. One of the commentators I read this week said, Remember, this really isn't the triumphal entry. Jesus came humble, lowly, riding on a donkey. The people loved it. The drama, the potential, the pageantry. But they just walked away. They could walk away. Got tired, bored, something else captured their attention. See you later. So what is the triumphal entry then? You see, when we look at life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven, that's not the end of the story. No, it's not over. It isn't finished. And the really cool thing is your life, your life, your life is a part of the story, the story that's still being written as we gather here today. You see, the part that we don't emphasize enough is that the triumphal entry, the really super-duper final one, is still to come. And with that triumphal entry, nobody walks away. There'll be no debate as to who this is. No asking, who was that guy anyway? That's when the kingship is finally declared to the human race. That is to both the living and to the dead. How about that? So, my friends, if you thought this day was special, you ain't seen nothing yet. The best for some, and for others the worst, is yet to come. Because the king is coming back, and the Bible promises that he is large and in charge. Wait for it. Well, lastly, remember, each day you're living in God's history. Do you ever think of your life as history? You're making history every day. You're a part of it. Now, I don't mean that in a negative way. Hey, pal, you're history. Not that. No. Every day you are history. You're a part of the human drama that God is guiding and bringing to this dramatic conclusion with the return of Jesus. God has you as a part of his story. His story. History. That's what it is. It's his story that he's doing. And that's the amazing thing. Now, those of you who are watching here, I'm going to tell you, every week, my buddy Barney and I and my granddaughter Faith, because we're going to record something else a little bit later, just three of us in a room. And, you know, you might think, well, you know, you're having a kind of a church service there, and, and maybe in the background you're hearing, holy, holy, holy. No, that's not what we're doing here. We're having all kinds of stuff going on. You know what? Usually what we're doing is we're trying to see how many verses of the Ballad of Davy Crockett we know. And we're saying it back and forth to each other. We love it. Now, here's the thing about Barney is that he's a great researcher. Anything we do, he's on his computer. He pulls it out. And we start singing. I mean, you know, we had a debate over the actual tune to the theme song of the 18 TV show. We got it down. We got it down. We have a lot of fun doing this. And the other week, we got talking about a TV show. 
TV show that the newsman Walter Cronkite used to host. I think it was on the weekends. And it was a history show. And what he would do is he would take you back into history and let you see how it was dramatized. They would dramatize the whole thing, but they would turn, you know, it was on the radio, but then when it was on TV, they'd turn and look at you, and you'd become a part of the history. They'd include you into what was going on. And they did things like the Hindenburg crash and the signing of the Magna Carta, all kinds of big historical events. And then at the end of the program, Walter Cronkite would summarize what happened, you know, on this historic day, and he reminded his viewers in, in that, you know, he had this special kind of deep voice. What sort of a day was it? It was a day like all days, filled with those events that alter and illuminate our times. All things are as they were then, except you were there. I love that. I was a part of it. But guess what? You're like those people on that sunny day in spring when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And he shook the whole town. Those people who celebrated and then left, they didn't realize they were a part of history. A history that lasts forever. And for you and me, every day you walk on planet Earth, and especially if you're walking with this same Jesus, you're not only seeing history, you're not only experiencing history, you, my friends, are making history with your life until the king returns so on this easter week go out and make some good history good history for the king this week because guess what he's coming back he's coming back one day for you and me let's pray Father, we thank you. You're a great and awesome God. We thank you for this Easter week. We thank you for all your goodness. We thank you for the way that you keep your promises, the way you love us, the way you do miracles for us, all those things. And Lord, this is just too exciting, too good stuff to keep to ourselves. There may be folks out there, Lord, who need to know you in their lives. And so if you're here today and you're listening to this, watching this, and you're thinking, you know, I have never made a commitment to this Christ. I want to be a part of his history. I want to be on the good side. I want to be on the winning team. Then all you need to do is come before him and say, Lord, I know that I'm not perfect. I'm a sinful person. Just like your Bible says, I know that I've, I've done things you don't want me to do. It's thought things I've been who you don't want me to be. But you said that when you died on the cross, that you forgave my sins. You paid for my sins. And so now I want you to forgive me. I want you to have that count for my life. And I want you to come into my life and I'm ready to serve. You're going to be like those, those, those two guys, those two blind guys. And I'm going to start following you. I'm going to see and do it. I'm going to be like those two disciples who when you tell me to do something, I'm going to go do it. Lord, let us do that. Let us do that. When you say, God, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be a part of the parade of history. God says, welcome. Welcome. Join in. Because we're marching to victory. Thank you, Father, for Easter and for all that it means. Bless us this day and this week. And we pray it in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today. It's a great week. And we look forward to Easter and the day of resurrection when all of history turns again in another direction. Hope you can be with us. If not, we'll meet you online and we'll be talking about the wondrous miracle that God did that Easter Sunday. Now, before we go... I'd like to simply bless you before we go. So let me do that right now, okay? Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great Easter week, a great Easter. And remember, God loves you. We love you here too and love to see you whenever you can come. God bless you all and goodbye.